Unlike all of us at Channel 9 and millions of you in lounge rooms around the country, I suspect there may have been quite a few MPs who breathed a sigh of relief when Laurie Oakes announced his retirement. After all, for politicians, the mere thought of being in an Oakes story on the nightly news was enough to raise a cold sweat. For more than half a century, Laurie has reported without fear or favour the biggest scoops in federal parliament. Along the way, he's become, I think, the finest political journalist this country has ever seen. Canberra and the Fourth Estate will both crumble a little without Laurie Oakes, but before he goes, we thought we'd see if he can answer questions as well as he can ask them. Laurie, do you feel naked without your clipboard? Yes, and I resent the fact that you're armed with one, Charles. <laughs> but I normally interview politicians. I don't interview journalists who are not used to it. I... Yeah, this is a pretty rare experience for me. It's been a terrific life. I've met wonderful, strange, weird people and uh, covered some pretty dramatic events over the years. After a lifetime of reporting, Laurie Oakes is packing it in. Uh, oh, this is the old night in a new budget. This was, your, this was one of your finest hours, wasn't it? <laughs> it a great story. Into the cardboard cartons go the cartoons. That's when I was a penthouse pet, a cartoon in penthouse. Really? Yeah. Oh, at least you kept your clothes on. I did. What's it like putting this stuff in a box? Oh, I look sad, but I, but I think my timing's right. I think people have put up with me for a long while, Charles. This is the lion's den, a typical old school journo's office full of books, papers and memories. Where will these go? Look, they might, they might go down to my beach house or they, they might have to sit in a box in the garage for a while. Keep looking at the chair. I, look, I, think I know I, it's unseemly because it's still warm. I think it would suit you. You think it would? Yeah. Well, well, I could feel good. right at home here. But tell me, what does the job involve? Well, the job involves living politics. You have 24 hours a day. Seven days a week, really. If, if you don't live it, you can't really report it. They say his office clock has stood at 10 to 3 for years now. Laurie never clocks off. What is the significance of the office clock? Oh, look, I love Elvis. I've always loved Elvis. And uh, he, he contained lessons for journalism in some of his songs. I mean, there's a line in one of the songs that's saying you can't build dreams on suspicious minds. Well, I mean, I built my dream on a very suspicious mind. Good, let her rip. Are they being tortured? You were dancing in your office before you got up to give that speech. Why were you dancing? Dancing? A Laurie Oaks interview always has a politician caught in a trap. The position of Mr Peacock sitting out there waiting to challenge your leadership. Does that worry you? And do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? If you keep this up, people are going to start thinking you're human. The, uh... You're in a hole politically. I assume you don't think that's entirely down to Bill Shorten's brilliance. But aren't you concerned that the government looks sloppy? Yes. The reason I have a clipboard is because I'm not finding this interview at this stage very easy. It's a footnote in history, therefore I'm feeling the pressure of it. How do you approach an interview under those terms? You've been doing it longer than me. Yeah, I used to I used to put hours of preparation. You're trying to think of everything a politician might yeah. might say to try and get out of answering a question. That, that was why I had a, on the clipboard. I had written down the possible answers they might give and ways to point out the, uh, the holes in those answers. You claim you were set up. How, why and by whom? To begin at the beginning, where does the Laurie Oak story start? Well, I was born in Newcastle and uh, when I was six, my father moved to Cockadoo Island in northwestern Australia. And it was a great place to, uh, to, to have your childhood. You'd wander around all day pretending to be cowboys or pirates. Or you'd yes. come out of school and straight down to the beach and into the sea. When Laurie was in high school, his family moved back to New South Wales, where it was the old story. A great school teacher recognises a great talent. A guy called Ivan Kinney is, is still around. And, uh, and because he was such a good teacher, I think that's why I became a journalist. He, he encouraged me, and English was my favourite subject, and he got me writing. And uh, I, I probably owe a lot to, uh, to Ivan Kinney. From school to Sydney Uni, where a dapper Laurie edited the student newspaper. Improbably, his first real job was a midnight to dawn crime reporter for the old Sydney Mirror. This must have been a baptism of blood to cover crime. Yeah, well, it, it was certainly pretty exciting. I, I arrived at a, at a shooting once before the coppers. Yeah, that was pretty interesting. And uh, it, was, it was great training as a journalist and not bad training for political reporting. Mr Howard... When Laurie moved to Canberra, crime reporting took on a different meaning and it looked like the reporter himself 
might be a criminal. The leaking of the budget two days before it's due for release in Parliament is sure to be an acute embarrassment for the federal government. From Canberra, Laurie Oakes reports. Well, we don't have to wait until Tuesday night to find out what's in Mr John Howard's budget. It's been Laurie had nicked the 1980 federal budget. Ian Sinclair, a senior minister, accused me of using stolen documents. He thought I should be in jail. But rather than talk about it by the magic of television editing, let's go to the scene of the crime. Right. See you there. It's about this time of year? Yeah, it was in August 1980, and I came to this car park at the Statesman Hotel in Curtin. On a Sunday morning? On a I Sunday believe. morning and met a, met a bloke here who gave me a copy of the budget and he said you can have it for 15 minutes. And he went inside, presumably for a drink, and I sat in my car and I had a little tape recorder and I just gabbled every word of the budget speech into my tape recorder in 15 minutes. What Mr Howard is going to say on Tuesday night is no longer a mystery. In fact, his speech will be something of an anti-climax. John Howard called you the budget burglar. Yeah, it's a great What an honour. Yeah, and he said it with a smile. Laurie wasn't a one-scoop wonder. The memo leaked to National 9 News and the Bulletin magazine says, we have been just too tricky on some issues. Realising this memo is political dynamite. In Canberra, the name Oaks became synonymous with amazing scoops and embarrassing revelations. Laurie joins us now live, and this is getting more and more serious for the government. Yes, it is, Brian. It could hardly be more serious. This is a leaked budget document, but it's a headache for the opposition. Appearing exclusively on the Nine Network Sunday program. Now I've learned that Mr Keating has given Labor colleagues details of an undertaking. This leak is a massive embarrassment for Mr Rudd. Not the fake polls! Not the fake polls! But behind the serious persona, Laurie always had a sense of fun. Sports bet. Ran a, ran a book on what colour tie I'd wear tonight. <laughs> and I, I can tell you that Sportsbet has now tweeted, stuff this, we're paying out on all colours. <laughs> You're renowned for your scoops, but do you always know they're going to happen? Well, sometimes you do. Mr Keating, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Laurie. But Keating didn't operate that way. He'd, he'd rather give you a surprise. And I remember what the one size black band for the six months that he came on the Sunday program and in the space of one interview dropped three stories that were page one stories in various newspapers. The government's looking at a revolution in television, aviation and education. Canberra is a small town with a lot of open secrets which often go unreported. Like the Gareth Evans, Cheryl Kerno affair. There is no big, deep, dark secret. But there is a big secret. A leaked email confirms that when Gareth Evans, then deputy leader to Kim Beasley, brought Ms Kerno into the Labor fold in late 1997, they'd been having an affair for several years. I, I hated that story. I still hate it. I wish I hadn't done it. Really? Yeah. But uh, why? Because well, I, I, I just don't like that kind of you know. Revealing personal secrets kind of a journalism. No, I, I'm with you. But I, but I think I had no choice because these two people, because the positions these people had and the fact that it was kept secret and lied about, uh, to, to say that it, it wasn't relevant to the politics of the nation is, is just not tenable. Did you lose any friends over this? Oh, lots. Yeah. Does that hurt you? Yeah. But I understand it because I, I understand why they feel that way. Well, Laurie Oaks, Prime Minister, Nine Network. When Laurie Oakes shows up at a press conference, politicians quake, and quite rightly. Uh, is it true that Mr Rudd indicated to you that if closer to the election, polling showed that he was an impediment to the re-election of the government, that he would then voluntarily stand aside and hand over the leadership to you? And everybody knew when Laurie goes to the press club, yeah. which he doesn't very often do, that a hand grenade is going to be thrown. Yeah. Is it also true that you agreed that this offer was sensible and responsible, and that when the meeting resumed, you said you'd changed your mind, you'd been informed that he didn't have the numbers in caucus and you're going to challenge anyway. And that was an interesting question of, should I do it at the press club, in which case everyone else got my story, because mm -hmm. I'd had a leak on what happened at the meeting, or do I just write a story for, and put it on Channel 9? Well, I thought, I'm going to have to get Julia Gillard's reaction, so I'll go to the press club. Uh, thanks, Laurie. Some special things obviously happen when you become Prime Minister, one of which is that the great Laurie Oakes comes, comes to your national press club addresses, so I thank you for that. That's You're not above theatre and drama, are you? Oh, look, I, I, th I think journalism is, is, is partly about that. I mean, you, you do need to attract attention for things you think are important. Who told you? Who dropped you the information on the agreement that Gillard had with Rudd? 
No, I can't say, Charles. No, I got you to say that because I want to talk to you about confidentiality. Mm. You know, well, You'd go to jail for this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah I think you, you have to be prepared to protect your sources in, in this job. <laughs> Complicated. As Laurie calls time on a great career, it's fitting to have a last drink or two. Laurie, you did that very well. Like a pro. Yeah, but you don't actually film yourself a lot in bars, so I guess you've got a lot of stories here. Well, look, when I'm in a bar, I'd rather not have a camera, partly because I get stories in bars. And uh, the bar I get most stories in, of course, was the, uh, the non-members bar in the old Parliament House, full of stories. In those days, half the members were half drunk half the time, and so were the other half. Whereas the journos... Well, we were fully drunk most of the time. <laughs> And at one stage, we decided that we should get out of journalism a lot earlier than you have and that we should run our own bar and we should be that side of the bar, not this. And, and I remember there was a hotel for sale in Hobart at the was. time and we'd, we'd had a few sherbets and we thought we'd buy it. And I rang my wife and there was a silence and she said, you'd be the Basil Fawlty of Tasmania. <laughs> she was right. It's not too late now, though. We might think about it again. Yeah. Cheers, Charles. I don't know about you, but when I hear a Prime Minister say, I'm a strong leader, as Malcolm Turnbull did today, I think if he really was strong and if he showed strength, would he need to say it? Laurie turns 74 tomorrow, and he has just one week left in journalism. You would think it's all over, but then again, a week is a long time in politics, especially if Laurie Oakes is around. Uh, do you have a bomb to drop before you go? Not yet, but uh, you know, if, if, if anyone's watching, and <laughs> I, I'm, I'm still available until the 18th to drop bombs. You if anyone been... has something they'd like to leak, I'm here, Charles. Of course, you've said that you're addicted to journalism. Well, I pinched that from Dan Rather, who said, you know, journalism is, is more addictive than crack cocaine, and he's dead right. I, d I don't believe you when you say you're going to go cold turkey. I am, but it's going to be tough. I haven't worked out what I can use as a patch yet. <laughs> well, you, well, there's a story. Is you're going to read detective novels? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm hoping that although that'll be my methadone program. What's your parting word? Goodbye and thank you. So people have treated me brilliant, brilliantly over all these years. I mean, I've, I've had a lot of help from a lot of people. I've had a lot of luck, and uh, I'm very grateful to all of them. Laurie Oakes, goodbye and thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm the one who's going to cry.